So, hello and welcome here to the cinema of the, the Deutsches Film Museum. I'm happy that so many of you came tonight. Um, we are starting today, we're very happy to have the first out of three programs on this uh, series of films from um, Deborah Stratmann. We're very happy that she's also here with us uh, for all these screenings. Um, and I uh, hope you also come tomorrow for the next uh, two screenings at four and at six tomorrow. And um, I would like to thank uh, Louise Bukhart who has uh, organized created this program here as a part of a larger German tour and we're very happy to be able to bring these films to Frankfurt as well. So please welcome with me Louise Bukhart who will make an introduction to this program tonight. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Good night to everybody. I'm very happy that you are here and that, we're, that we have more urgence than I expected. I'm very happy about that. Um, so thank you, Laura, for the introduction. I want to stress again that I'm very happy that we were able to get Deborah Stratman here, who's sitting in the second row, and who will, um, where we will actually give Q and A's after each of the three screenings that we're going to have to today and the two tomorrow. Um, as an introduction, I shortly want to maybe to explain how it all come, came uh, with Deborah Stratman actually did a program four years ago here on 16 millimeter um, and how directors from the 2000 until 2016 um, still shot on six on 16 millimeter and I was interested in who is actually doing that and so I had like a program with different directors <clears throat> and Deborah Stratman was one of them and I actually showed In Order Not To Be Here, which is one of the four films that we're going to screen tonight. And a few months later, or maybe a year later, I was at Oberhausen and I saw a second film of Deborah Stratman, Hack Circuit, which is going to be screened tonight too. And I thought, okay, these two films are films that are very, very appealing to me. And I thought, this is, this is a director I want to invite once. And so this idea stayed in my mind for the last four years, and I'm very happy that one now in context of this tour within Germany and Vienna also, we can, I can have this dream coming true. Um, and while I'm talking about this program and who's all doing it, I want to thank the Deutsches Film Museum for, for doing it, for helping me getting funding for this program. And I especially um, also want to thank um, Hans-Peter Merbach, uh, who's going to project um, the three programs and we're having all kinds of different formats and so he's going to dance between the formats and the film reels and I thank him a lot for that because I know it's challenging. Um, and I also want to thank my cooperation partners. So um, these films and a few others were also shown at the Arsenal um, Institute for Film and Video Kunst in Berlin. And they're going to, a few days after these screenings, the prints are going to be shipped to Vienna at the Österreichisches Filmmuseum, who is also, um, which is also a cooperation partner of this um, screening, this program. Um, I also want maybe just to... Um, yeah, maybe um, just to, to have a few words, because um, on the title also, I, I don't know if Deborah, you also already saw that, but I called it uh, Maximalist Minimalism, which is actually uh, two words that you used during an interview um, that you gave um, with Nick uh, Pickerton after a screening um, or like cycle um, a few films in 2016 at the Anthology Film Archive and and where you were saying, okay, that might be a nice pitch. And, and I love that idea because while I was trying to talk to people about your films when they did not know them, it was all like, yeah, what kind of film does Derry Stratman make? And I'm like, hmm, good question. <laughs> hmm, how can I sum them up? How, wh how, what, what kind of common denominator do all these films have? And it was always a very, very challenging question. The most easy one, the first that comes was a very challenging one. And so I thought, yeah, maximalist minimalism, why not? And maybe we can talk after screening a bit more about um, how that could be some kind of way to, to sum um, your works. Um, and then I found an interesting quotation of Pamela Khan, a woman I know, um, 
who said following, um, quote, Stratman makes work to engage her perpetually inquisitive mind, a mind that asks lots of complicated questions, ones to which she really never expects to receive answers. And if she does receive answers with too much facility, it's like she'll decide it's not worth pursuing after all. So we're having films where a lot of questions are being asked and most of the time you'll never get any answers or you'll get beginning of answers and you'll try to, to maybe answer them yourself but you, you'll never get fulfilled and you'll never have like a put on the plate um, answer for you. Um, and yeah, a lot of these works that we're going to show tonight are part of it too. And we're opening with A Magician House, which is a film, um, a very short film, six minutes from 2007, which might be in, an introduction in an atmosphere um, of some of Stratman's work um, with some kind of a contrast which we find often between the picture and the sound and how the relation is actually coming from how you are putting it together and not really that it matches. I mean, you you don't have a lot of dialogue and maybe in Hack Circuit you've got some kind of people talking where the sound is actually matching their lips, but most often, most often you have sound coming from somewhere else which you relate yourself with the picture you see. Mm, and then the second film is Village Silence from 2012. It's also a very short film. And this is a bit found, not really found footage um, film, but some kind of new edited film inspired by the silent village of Humphrey Jennings from 1943, which is a 30 minute film um, about the resistance um, of a small village um, while the um, Nazi regime entered their. Um, yeah, the everyday life. And um, Deborah Stratman uh, made the 30 minutes film into a new version of seven minutes. And and this was a very, um, well, sound is actually doing a lot of the work. And this actually related also to, to how audio um, and repetition is a motive of control, or how you can relate it to control. Then we have the third film, which was actually, for me, um, the start of how I want to do um, something with Severus Stratman and um, called Hack Circuit from 2014, which is a bit longer film, 16 minutes, um, and very, very choreographed work. Um, was a, for Stratman film, maybe I could, would even say is some kind of linear structure um, with characters that we follow for a short while. Um, and it's actually a single steady cam shot um, outside, and then we go inside into Foley studio. Um, and I would maybe stress again the projection, um, the the date of production because it's 2014, and it's maybe one can just be reminded of that um, a year before you had the revelation that Edward Snowden actually did about the global surveillance program, which is actually a topic that's addressed indirectly inside this film and how Foley artists are doing a work that's being invisible later in the film when you see the finished product and, and how um, surveillance could be um, in a similar way um, something related to, to this invisible work that's done with Foley artists. Um, the fourth um, and last film is, um, is a lot, has a lot to do with, I mean, it's kind of a post 9-11 film where you feel a lot of this climate of fear found in the US um, in the suburbs and how people living in suburbs have a wish um, for safety, I mean all of us, but how they actually respond to this wish and safety and how and what kind of consequences are coming from that. And in this film you're actually stressing that people wishing for safety um, are actually um, kind of starting a whole state of control even within, while being wanting to be safe, they're actually letting other people control them. So these would be like the four films we're seeing now. We have 
two programs to come on Saturday, where I'd be, of course, very glad if you all come back. And as we already said, uh, Deborah Stratman will be present in all three screenings, and I'm very looking forward to the discussion after the screenings, and I hope you have questions. Okay, then enjoy the production for now. See you later. Hello. Okay, glad you're still there. Um, <laughs> good statement. So you're of course welcome to to ask question whenever you feel like it, and even within our answers a question if there's something that remains unclear to you. So welcome. Um, we already have the first question. This is really quick. <laughs> Um, Can I first say uh, just thank you, first of all, to um, Luis and um, the projectionist and to you, the audience who makes the film. Um, I really truly feel that. Uh, once I'm finished with the film, it's the audiences and uh, it's your experience, your temporal experience that is the film. So thank you. And for accommodating my English. Ich habe ein bisschen Deutsch, aber sehr schlecht. So thank you for that. Just before you start, just if people are feeling uncomfortable with English and rather ask a question in German, it's possible. Well, I'll try to translate the best I can and don't be shy uh, with the language. Okay, so welcome. I try in English. Uh, w during the filming of The Running Man, uh, I can understand uh, that you didn't leave the man alone with the camera because uh, there might have been something happening very interesting. But uh, after you filmed him like five or six or eight minutes, I don't know, uh, what was your motivation to not cut that? Well, it took a lot actually to keep it as short as it was. Originally, <laughs> I, ha I shot him for a bit longer, probably almost 20 minutes. Um, but within the context of a 33 minute film, that felt at the time too long. Now I might make a different decision. But um, the way the camera, its oppressiveness, its sort of orientation of being over, and its relentless pursuit of this human figure, which we haven't seen much of in that film, um, was a sort of mm, not ethical or but sort of an emotional um, political necessity for me for the rest of the film. Um, um, this kind of grinding, this grinding insistence on um, being able to have your suspect if you have their image um, was central to the idea around sort of the um, these cycles of fear and safety which triggered the film. Like the more we desire safety, the more there is to fear. And, and that circuit or that, um, that knot of, um, of thinking that leads to a certain kinds of subdivisions being built and certain kinds of fences being put up and um, urban planning in general um, sort of produced that scene kind of came out of my thinking. And so I didn't want to, I felt like just to have him there for a minute or two, it wasn't sufficient. It was insufficient for um, um, how pervasive the cycles of fear and safety are in um, determining the environment that I grew up in. and. Um, so that's part of why I shot it for as long as I did. I had one take that was even better, <laughs> but the, the camera didn't turn on actually. So that we, we tried this two times. The first time, um, the runner, Joaquin, who it's a stage shot, if that hasn't yet been evident, um, uh, because I couldn't find something from already existing, although I thought I might. So if I had found a shot that existed, from a sheriff's department, I might have used it, but I couldn't, and so I staged it. And the first time we did it, um, two police cars started chasing Joaquin because they saw the news. I was in a news helicopter because I couldn't afford a helicopter, so I made an arrangement with Fox News, which is a, 
a sort of infamous uh, news channel in the U.S., and they do a daily traffic report, and I was able to negotiate with the helicopter pilot who contracts his helicopter to Fox News on the way back from shooting the traffic. Sorry, this is a very long answer. <laughs> But it's exciting. So, um, on the way back, I thought, okay, we'll plot out the run, and we'll just do it on the way to park the helicopter. And on that first run, the um, two two cop squad cars started chasing Joaquin, and it looked incredible because, in this version, he just looks so he looks a bit fit. You know, it's like a very easy run. In the first, he looked quite nervous. It was incredible. But the the FLIR operator, the man who operate who operated the, um, there's a camera mounted on the bottom of the helicopter and a gyroscope, and you you work it with a joystick in the cabin of the helicopter, and he basically just forgot to press record. He was recording to beta. So we got all the way back, and I thought, oh, my God. So this was the second shoot, which happened a couple months later. Um, and in the end, I actually, as much as I loved the material seeing the cop car start chasing him and the paranoia that induced in Joaquin, I feel like this take is stronger for the way that he loses he loses the camera's gaze more effectively. So the way the camera gropes for him, I feel like, for me anyway, is very emotionally necessary, that there is an escape from this kind of omniscience of... Um, a control infrastructure, whether that be architecture or um, something, or you know, visual. Um, so I so I love the way he loses the camera in this take. Phew, I'll try to be shorter in my next answers. Sorry. Already a second on question coming. No, I need to wait for the next one. Um, talking about control. Um, and circles. I, I mean, th this program is a lot about silence, about um, repetition, about how these two elements have a lot to do um, with control. And um, and I'd like to, I'd like to ask you um, how. I mean, hack circuit, and in order not to be here, both have this element of, of loop, even though they're not really, but you have like this first and last scene that are in some kind of a way connected. Um, and I, I mean, Village Silence is also a completely different way of, of, of rounding the thing up. And um, I don't know how, how much comes up during the first viewing of Village Silenced, um, especially if one does not know the, the original film you inspired by. But um, to, to me, I like the fact how the sound is actually telling the whole story within these seven minutes with the first audio taken directly. I don't think you modified anything from the first audio from the film. It's, it's coming, the audio is coming later in the film from Humphrey Jennings, but it's, I don't know that you added anything. For the audio? But for the audio for the first part yeah, yeah, yeah. of Fiddle Silence. highly constructed, actually. Okay. I did all the foley. I added sound design. It's meant, oh, nice. it's meant okay. to feel like it's original sound, but it's actually quite constructed. So I'm definitely pulling from his film. I'm mm -hmm. pulling um, audio from his film, but I'm also, but that's only about 30% of the soundtrack. The rest is constructed so that it seems that it's what the images would, you know, would, would yeah. want. Yeah. So it's good that you think it's original <laughs> because I, because it is important to me that it, it feels very natural, that it feels like organically coming from the image, that one doesn't suspect that it's actually a construction. It never happens in your film, right? Or at least, it is, I mean, you, you see nearly every film, apart from Hack Circuit, camera, edit, and sound design, Deborah Stratman. And um, yeah, and have the feeling of this, of really this kind of contradiction between image and sound and how you actually tell it a different story through this difference. And okay. Okay, I, I like. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I so, so, riff on that if you Yeah, like. yeah, no, of course, of course, of course. Okay. And okay, nice. And how. Um, 
And could you maybe explain for, for the Ojas the three parts of Oju that you did? I mean, the, the three chapters of Fill in Silence, because I think at first, when I first saw the film, I didn't relate exactly on what it could tell or what how you also have the sound as a strong element of control. Maybe you can mm. explain that a bit. Sure. So um, I guess to first preface it a bit, it would be to say that Humphrey Jennings, 19... 43, I think, film. It's um, very much a product of its time. Um, so it's a British documentary with um, a voiceover. There are uh, some sound effects, but pretty minimal, and then um, ambient sound of environments. Um, but the voiceover is quite prevalent, and it definitely, I would say, is, is the... Um, the omniscient parts of the soundtrack. So um, I removed that, and the editing is also changed, but I wanted a way to um, to speak about performance as commemoration. So in his film, he asked the villagers of Quimgid, which is a village in Wales, to reenact the annihilation of the citizens of Lidice after they had resisted the Nazi occupation of their town. So. The men were killed, the women and children were sent away, the town was, you know, for all practical purposes, erased. And Jennings, less than a year after that happened, went to Quimgid, a mi another mining town. Um, Lidice was a, a mining town, a sort of a factory town. And he had, the, so the people you see on the screen are um, villagers from the town, they're not actors. And he had them collectively reenact. Um, well, the erasure of this population, which, so that was what ori originally got me interested in the film, is it felt like a very kind of ahead of its time, pressing it way to think about memorialization vis-a-vis -vis reenactment and what it means to make a memorial for something, but through actions that we do, through ritualization, through something that's time-based, um, because I feel like to some degree that's what I do as a filmmaker, and um, and that strategy really interested me. So then I thought, okay, well, how can I also speak to an re-enactment or a revisiting of footage, in this case, Humphrey Jennings' footage, but um, also through the lens of sound as a mode of social control, which is just a general interest of mine as someone who fully believes that sound is half of a film, and um, and I love the subversive qualities it has as something that's not visible and that's very manipulative and um, and also there's been military many um, regimes of power and military that have used sound as a mode of social control so in a way the film also came out of research I was doing in some non-film projects around just strategies of using audio to control populations from having I don't know, supersonic jets fly over a civilian population and so it creates a sonic boom, which is very, you know, like a startling <laughs> explosive sound just to kind of keep the population on edge from that to like sonic camouflage and all kinds of different sonic surveillance techniques and I, I had gotten really in deep and so I think in a way that ended up just infecting how I decided to deal with village silence and I thought an easy way to a kind of almost a pedantic way or a, a tutorial sort of it's almost like a school project or something it's like well use the same footage three times with three different soundtracks and um, as flat-footed as that technique is on one hand it's also always revelatory I think to realize how much sound affects our sense of time our sense of you know emotion our sense of mood how much we are manipulated by it even when we're conscious that we're being manipulated by it which I guess hacked circuit talks about as well um, so the sirens is just a I don't know I have a soft spot for sirens I guess but but I mean it sort of relates to that kind of um, when one time structure, which cinema certainly does, but uh, audio does it very well as well. I, if a time 
you know, the reason Muzak became so popular is because there's a certain time signature to this music that infects your own time frame that then could make you more conducive to, say, buying things. Or there's all kinds of research that go into the ways that the time sig some other time signature, other than our own personal internal time signature, which can be delivered through sound, can um, affect our decisions and affect the patterns by which we live our life. And I really am sort of obsessed about this idea. So, um, you know, something so oppressive as the, the sirens is, is, you know, it's kind of, you know, pushing you down. And then the silence, obviously, at the end, I mean, to some people, it feels like that's the longest version. To some people, the shortest. You see things that you didn't see with the sound, you know, not just because it's already happened three times, but I liked, um, it just seemed like a fun way to, to riff on a dark history. <laughs> not to make light of it, but I mean, it's an homage to Jennings as much as it is to um, a kind of interest in these s modes of sound control. Questions? <laughs> Well, if, if there isn't any other questions, uh, maybe you said it already and uh, I didn't uh, hear it due to my restricted English, but uh, when the guy was running, did he know that he was filmed? Was it candid camera or was it an athlete or was it uh, because he just ran and he didn't uh, seem to have a goal? He was an actor um, and he knew he was being filmed and his goal was to get away. Basically, I mean, the longer version of the scene, he he leaves a school, actually. Um, and that part we don't see. I cut that out. And it happened not long after some the Columbine killings, actually, which were very much in my mind. And so I was thinking about this kind of figure. But you don't know really. You, you like, has he done something wrong? Has he not done something wrong? So his you know, maybe as an actor, <laughs> he could have looked like he was struggling a bit more. Maybe I could have chosen someone who was a less of a good athlete. <laughs> but, but he is, um, the first scene you see in the film is from a sheriff's department. So that is actual police footage when the dogs are apprehending the people on foot. And then the last scene, as you spoke about, that you come back to, that's a construction, a totally construction, like a choreographed scene that I choreographed. So I think part of my interest as well is just thinking about that gap between, um, you know, I don't know, actual social conditions and or uh, police state or whatever you want to think of, and then what it means to enact that or perform it or um, have the realization that something's constructed. I mean, that's an interesting moment for me when when I'm myself watching cinema is if you drift back and forth between being aware of the construction and being completely seduced and in the film and, and you don't care about thinking about whether it's a construction or not. I like that space between those two places. I think it's what activates much of Hacked Circuit as well. Um, I am. I see us getting back to hack circuit. Yeah, like sorry, every I'm, every yeah. three sentences, you're yeah, actually yeah. talking about control of our sound, yeah, about yeah. in Program staging. Produces it. Yeah. And yeah, and I of course very very much like to to talk about hack circuit. But there is a yes. question in the audience in the middle. I, of I, it. I just want to say, um, I'm sorry if I'm speaking too fast. Let me know. I'll speak more slowly. I have a bad habit of speaking too fast. Um, but I welcome simple questions as well. It doesn't have to be something that you're like, this is a very philosophical question. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering about the context that you usually show your films in and if you think there's like an ideal context or ideal situation. Also, if you say the audience like makes the film, like what's the best way to encounter them? Is it a screening like this or like a festival? Or um... Well, festivals can often be tough if for short films because the programmers, they have a tough task of just trying to make programs out of very unlike cinema sometimes. It's easier, I think, for features in a festival. Um, I prefer events like this in a way because 
I, I enjoy having a chance to think through what the work is doing new by how, by what the audience is thinking and seeing and, or getting or not getting. Um, I prefer the cinema to uh, a museum, like a gallery or something. I prefer a situation like this, where it's very quiet, where you have a comfortable seat, where you have an easy view, where you can lose your body, you feel less conscious of your body, so you can be really um, taken over by the cinema, potentially. Uh, that said, I also am interested in when we, when we, when our attention shifts, right? And if so, if I'm in a smaller cinema, I like seeing when people kind of sit up and pay more attention and when they drift away. I mean, I think as someone who, um, to steal Tarkovsky's phrase, sculpts in time, those intersections and junctures are really important to me and thinking about ways to sculpt attention is a lot of how I think about editing. So in an environment like this, um, even though I wasn't sitting with you today, but uh, it is, you know, it makes it um, what I think of as sort of the totalitarian nature, totalitarian nature of cinema, where one, you, the audience member, kind of gives up your native sense of time to kind of get sucked into another. I mean, that's what I love as a cinema goer myself, and I feel like spaces like that, um, you know, are like a machine that make that uh, more seamless. So, yeah. We have another question. You can. Yeah. Yeah. She raised her hand. Here. Oh, I thought you were. The woman um, on 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 your right. No. Okay. Then you can sorry. think of something, though. <laughs> like, well, actually, I do have a question. <laughs> oh, there's one coming up. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know um, how to, to start right. I, I would like to ask um, about the first film, um, The Magician's House, uh, which uh, appealed me the most. Um, well, that uh, could have been <laughs> about childhood memories, but uh, of course there is a, a certain mystery. Um, maybe it's the absence of the inhabitant and there's something going on, of course, and uh, <laughs> it could have been um, not so um, traumatic, but in, in the end, um, uh, yeah, we were made uh, sh sure about the uh, music um, uh, that is, is creating a certain uh, atmosphere of um, unease. And um, I'm not sure <laughs> what it is uh, about. Um, is it uh, the fear itself? Um, yeah, which is um, uh, asked. Um, Um, let's see, The Magician's House, I guess it's less fear specifically that I think to me was catalyzing the film, but more a kind of um, an absence, which you definitely picked up on, and a sort of um, slight paranormal or a kind of... Uh, <sighs> A, s a thinness between the everyday and something else, something spectacular, something inexplicable, something a bit haunted. I The circumstances of shooting that film were very particular. I had um, been invited to do a series of lectures and, you know, kind of not unlike this, and was asked uh, by a colleague, a friend, a filmmaker, to stay in their house, but because of a series of events that happened right before I arrived, they couldn't be there. So the house was empty, some of the work I was to do was canceled, and it all was a bit like <sighs> stepping into this place where, um, you know, the rug had been pulled out a bit from under me, and I felt just compelled to shoot, and so because this friend was a filmmaker, 
I asked if I could borrow, I wrote them and asked, can I borrow your camera? And I just need two or three rolls of film. They said, fine. And I shot that film very quickly. And I was just responding to that mood, to this sort of, um, uh, I don't know, something like a, some kind of presence was there. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it felt so palpable that I knew I could film it quickly, could respond quickly. So I think, you know, when Roland Barthes in The Neutral, I don't know how he translates that in French, but he has this great book called The Neutral where he talks about, he's writing about the theme of the neutral, but at, at one point he talks about how if there's some idea what you're obsessed with, everything you read and everything you look at, that idea rises to the surface. So in a way, when I was shooting, it was similar. It kind of, that was, that idea of the thinness was already there, so I was kind of turning my camera, I was finding those things in this place that was full of, I could have made, you know, an infinite number of films there, but that's the film that kind of rose from the circumstances. Yeah. So it's something that was made very quickly and, or shot, shot within like an hour, two hours tops. And then, you know, some films are that way. Okay, cool. So it was about the mystery and not about uh, paranoia. Yes, for me, yeah. I mean, I, I can see how it could read as a paranoia, but it for me, it's it's a more comfortable mystery. It's it's a, yeah, a haunting, but not necessarily a horror film. For me, In Order Not to Be Here is a bit more of a horror film, but, but other people see it not. Right. Thank you. A couple down here, yeah. <laughs> so I just want to ask you to talk about hacked circuit, circuit, whatever you want to talk about. Then. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, let's see. What do I want to talk about? So I became obsessed with Foley stages, which are the type of stage that the gentlemen are working on, because I've taught sound design for many years. And when I was teaching in Los Angeles, I would sometimes bring my my class, my students, to a Foley stage. And um, the more I would visit them, the more I just became completely enamored with every object in the stage, how every object has two identities. It has its normal use identity, and it has its sound identity. And then the habits of Foley artists I mean, Greg, who's the Foley artist in this film, his collection is massive. This isn't even his collection. I mean, in his garage, it's overstuffed. He's the main Foley artist at Warner Brothers Studios, so he has access to much larger stages than this one. Um, and I thought, okay, I think this can make a really interesting portrait. But then I also wanted the film to speak to the ways that we're manipulated by sound and how we don't notice how constructed the soundtrack is. And I thought one way to do that would be maybe to start in the world, quote unquote, on the street and to enter this um, stage of, of production where one produces space, literally, because it's with sound, I think we produce space more than with image. I truly feel that. Um, you know, image is what's in front of you. Sound is 360. So we know our space more from something sonic than something visual. So t to see a place where one, where space is produced and then to go back outside, but to question, wait, what's a production and what's not a production? or to see how things have been constructed and yet still be manipulated by the sound is very interesting to me, that even though we know, oh, probably most of these sounds are constructions, you still can be emotionally affected by, like when you first come around the corner past the fence and the music and the sound is quite mm, aggressive and there's a fight happening, that empty, corner feels very loaded. It feels very, uh, I think of the Rodney King beating, but maybe everyone has their own association with a violence that happens in a public space. Um, 
and so the main goal, which took me the longest, was to find a Foley stage that was close enough um, to the corner that one could be could go around the block within a relatively short amount of time. So I visited probably over 30 Foley stages in Los Angeles. Um, and there are some that are incredibly beautiful, huge. I visited the Sony and the Warner Brothers and Universal and many, many private studios. But And the problem with the big studios is that as incredible as they are, um, when you're outside, you're not outside. You're on the studio lot. So it's it's a, it's a it's not the street it's not the public street and and many of the ones i found you know just didn't have the right distance so this one when i finally found it i knew right away okay it's close enough to the to the block so making a circle won't take so long and then once i found it it was just yeah five takes and we we had it but um yeah i guess does that okay there's a story for you I got one more question, maybe okay, maybe okay. two. Is it about the running man? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. But you still got me running. Okay. Um, you did the four films between 2002 and 2014. Did you do any other film in between where people were talking? And second question, what did you do the last four years? And third question, what will you do from now on? Always <laughs> films with nobody talking. <laughs> I think I can go. <laughs> was, it, was it your purpose? Was it your purpose to not let the audience understand what was said in the background? Um, what was said in the backgrounds? Can you, you be know, more the, specific? The microphone, the the mechanical voices of uh, through some machines, the microphones. Uh, Walkies, talkies. You, you must have concentrated very much to understand what was being said. What was it your purpose to not make it easy to understand it? I wouldn't say it was my purpose, but I didn't want to erase the um, the fact that the audio was quote unquote on the air, that it was from a radio transmission device. I wanted that kind of muddiness of that technology to be part of the audio. So I would like it if, you know, people kind of understood what's being said at the beginning, but I don't, but I feel like even if one doesn't understand, I'm assuming you're talking about the radio communication at the beginning of In Order Not to Be Here. Is that what you're speaking about? Uh, the last film? And the end, mm -hmm. yeah. The end is, is, yeah, is very muddy. And it's the sound of Kevin Drum is meant to kind of be on the top and the other layers are there if you understand it i think it gives you more potential narrative information about the character who's running but i don't think your knowledge of what's being said you know is going to change your read necessarily of what you've seen um i have made many other films including between 2002 and 14 um and often with people just talking. stay here and you'll see yeah. many more sometimes there's a lot of talking non-stop talking tomorrow yeah um, five others i often yeah rely on interview quite a bit um sometimes i rely on screen on on screen text um I don't typically work uh, with actors in a traditional way where they're delivering lines um, or improvising, although I do in discrete scenes do that. But um, some of the films, yeah, I do have quite a bit more voice than any of these do. And what I'm working on now, I'm collaborating with uh, Barbara Hammer, actually, on a short film. And I'm working on a documentary that I'm shooting in Ethiopia about public voice and um, sort of especially women's public voice and traditions of resistance there. Um, yeah. I have a question. Do you have, do you still have time or how does it? Five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no.
not, not cooking up. Oh, we have. I know, see, people always have. <laughs> like, I'm not going to say my question. It's an easy question. Just the choice for the material that you filmed with, because uh, two of the movies were screened um, digitally and two were um, analog. So maybe your choice on material. Yeah, I, um, I'm very uh, omnivorous, I guess, or what would one say, um, eclectic when it comes to m material. Um, I would say this is a general rule, but in some of my longer films that are that I would consider essay films, like *Or the Land* and *The Illinois Parables*, to some degree, in order not to be here. Um, from Hetty to Nancy. Sometimes, um, I guess, what? The philosophical question that I'm trying to ask is quite hard for me, myself, to get my head around. And so I like working with celluloid um, because it slows me down a lot. And sometimes I feel like the questions that I'm trying to take apart and or even know how to ask myself need a slower pace of working um but that's not always the case sometimes i shoot with 16 quite quickly as you saw in the first or in a film like raised birds um i mean i love celluloid i love that it breathes and i think digital it's like the air has been evacuated from um, the image to some degree because there's no grain. I think the micro movement of the grain seduces our eye because we're prone, to, we, the eye is drawn to micro movements. And so even if we're not conscious of it, it, it draws our eye. And um, I also like its um, um, imperfection, for lack of a better word. It's imbalance, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, got a more organic feel to it but but I I really I like to choose different tools that f you know feel right for the circumstances of shooting or maybe the idea behind the film or how much time I have to shoot it so I'm not um there's not a hierarchy in my mind I don't I'm not a film purist I love shooting on celluloid but I I also shoot just as often on digital and I like seeing the ways that the different mediums dictate. A di they, they, they produce a different process and they produce very different films. So any of the digital films I had made, if I had made them on, on celluloid or vice versa, that it wouldn't have been the same film. And so I like how they, you know, the process kind of colors the, the form. I have not a question, but... <laughs> okay, and then this guy's got a microphone. Can we have him? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'd like to know something or a few words from you about the title of In Order Not To Be Here because it's part of this broader statement at the beginning of the film but it, it was so fast like the, the whole sentence I didn't get <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman has heard. the sentence is, is it is not necessary to be someplace else in order to not be here That's right. It's, it's not necessary to be someplace else in order not to be here. And um, it's from a, a book called Suburbia by one of the Willipo group, who is a French experimental um, literary collective. The main, the member that I know the most writing from is Georges Perec, but um, it's not Perec that wrote Suburbia. I can't remember the name of For now, for now, maybe. Sorry, I can't remember. It's one of the other members of the collective, and the book is brilliant. I think it's it's this quote is in there. I forget where in the in the, some of the beginning pages, and then the title "Suburbia," and then the entire book is just plain white pages with no <laughs> with no text. And because I was really interested in what for me was a certain sort of hollowness, a certain um, evacuation of texture that came in a way from the way the communities were planned and this this hyper uh, master planning of communities that was leaving out um, a kind of sloppiness which to me is a sort of is a sort of horror whereas to many people not at all to many people my parents included who you know I grew up in uh, a suburban 
town. Um, many people, I guess I was interested in what, why some environments produce what is a feeling of safety to some, whereas what, you know, to me it produced this terror, basically, you know, or a, a sense of horror vacui, you know, this, this empty, um, despite how much, you know, one might conquer distances, the emptiness of things was remaining really present. And that sentence I felt like um, articulated really what I was feeling about this place, what the what was behind what I was trying to get after with these master plan communities and uh, the kind of absence that feels pervasive to me there, um, especially obviously at night when, when no one's around, but even during the day, people don't walk. They only drive. It's not, it just feels like people go from their homes to their garage, which is inside their house. They get in their car, they go somewhere. There's, there's just like this, lack of interaction with the other that produces fear. It produces fear of people not like you and, and environments not like the ones you know. And um, I was really struggling, still struggle with that. So that's what that sentence came from. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think we can Thank wait. you so much. I hope I see some of you tomorrow. Thank you, Louise, so. Thank you, and Sarah. for your questions and the, your attention. Cool.